Hey everyone, I, I'm here with Neil deGrasse Tyson, renowned astrophysicist and host of uh, the popular Star Talk. Um, and you know, we're here on the occasion of um, just these fantastic images that have been taken by the James Webb Telescope of of our universe. And you know, I'm really focused on the metaverse. And one of the things that that I'm really focused on here is how this is going to help shape education over time. So um, we have some awesome stuff to show. And I'm, I'm really excited to be here with Neil to go through all of this because he's, he's kind of the, the leading figure to, to help explain all of this. But first, Neil, do you want to just talk for a bit about what's going on with the James Webb Telescope and where it is and, 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 and basically set the stage here? I would love to set the stage. So the James Webb Telescope has been sort of on the drawing boards for decades. There were early meetings where we said, after Hubble, where are we going to take our understanding of the universe? And we knew that there was this gap in our access to the universe in the earliest times, right after a period that we call the Dark Ages, while where the universe, right after the Big Bang, where the universe had matter and energy, but it wasn't making anything yet. No luminous stars yet. And so we call that the Dark Ages. And at the end of that Dark Ages, things start kicking in. Stars start getting made. Galaxies start being born. And we didn't have any data from that period. So people said, let's design a telescope to do that. Can't do it from Earth's surface, and even if we orbit the Earth, that's not good enough. We've got to find a special place to park this telescope. And so, out of this came a place, it's called one of the Lagrangian points of the Earth-Moon orbiting system. It's a place where all the forces of gravity balance. And it's a million miles from Earth, opposite the direction of the Sun. And if you park something there, it'll stay and orbit the sun with the Earth. Now here's the catch. This telescope is specifically tuned to observe infrared light because that's the light that reaches us from these newly born galaxies from 14, 13 billion years ago. So, but if you're gonna observe infrared, which is a heat source, okay? Uh, heat gives you infrared, your telescope has to be really, really cold. Otherwise, the telescope will observe itself, okay? So, if, so whatever you're observing, you gotta make sure your telescope is not interfering. So, you put it a million miles away from Earth and put a series of sunshades between it and the sun and it can forever look out into the universe and plunge to a very cold temperature. All of this happened. Uh, in, the, in the design and understanding of what this telescope would bring. And I have to give a shout out to the engineers that helped make this happen. All right, all the press is coming to we scientists to talk about the cool science, but part the curtains, there are engineers who scratched their head, had to figure out how, how do you launch such a thing? And as big as this telescope is, it's got to fit inside of a rocket. All right, the fairing of a rocket is not the size of the telescope. So they have to find a way to fold the telescope so that it can stuff it into a fairing, put it a million miles away, open the fairing and unfurl the, all the detectors and the, and the sunshades. So it, it is a marvel of engineering and I'm delighted to be able to share the fruits of that engineering with you and all of your audience. Awesome. So we have a bunch of things in virtual reality to look at, including some 3D images from the telescope and some videos of spacewalks and some awesome things that, have, that, that, that we can check out and, and feel like we're really there. So do you want to just jump into VR? Let's do that. Do, do, do I, how do you, how, is there something you say, like, I meet you on the other side or something? Is this <laughs> I guess we'll, we'll, I'll see you in space in a minute. You know, so can, Mark, that, that's me. I got the that, picture of me. Yeah, there you go. And, and, the, and the telescope. It gives you a, a real sense of scale for the thing. Yeah, so I was at a conference, a space conference in Colorado Springs, Colorado, of course. And Northrop Grumman, who is the sort of the, the engineering partner with NASA, brought this scale model of the telescope to the conference. And I said, I got to stand in front of this thing. And so there it is, the actual telescope. Uh, you see people in a, in a clean room uh, putting in the last touches. I want you to notice that there's this strut that goes across it. Um, that strut is actually responsible for diffracting starlight that gives the starlight those spikes you, might have, you will see in a later photo. So hang on for that. So this whole thing folds up into the fairing of 
a rocket. And like I said, it's an engineering marvel that we could get this to happen at all. We knew we couldn't use a single mirror because a single mirror doesn't give you that latitude. So you make a honeycomb mirror and the hexagonal shape is one of only three shapes that you can tile a floor with, the square, the triangle, and a hexagon. And so you do hexagons, and that's our mirror. And each one huh. is separately controlled, and then there you have it. Nice. Ooh. All right, so, so what are we looking at here? Ooh. Okay, so the spiky things that sort of resemble like the star of Bethlehem, uh, those are stars sitting right on our noses here in our own Milky Way galaxy. And those, like I said, those spikes come from the hardware that's within the telescope. So just ignore the stars for now. There's about a half dozen in this image. Big one right in the upper left, three across the bottom, one on the side, and, some, and you can see some others off to the thing. So what's going on here is, we have the deepest image ever taken of the universe. And notice a bunch of, everything else that's not those spiky things is an entire galaxy such as the Milky Way, containing hundreds of billions of stars. And we see them out to the farthest reaches of the universe. And you see these arclets that form a circle around the central region. There's a galaxy cluster right in the middle, which has a huge gravitational field. And those, those curved arclets are, are galaxies in the background near the beginning of the universe and their light has been distorted by the gravitational field of this cluster. And Einstein first described the fact that if you have a lot of gravity, it'll distort the very fabric of the space-time continuum. So this is direct evidence of that. What are kind of the smudges between the galaxies? For example, if you look at the arc over there. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Every single smudge in this image that does not have spikes is a distant galaxy just like our own. The galaxy catalog has all kinds of objects, all kinds of shapes and sizes. There's spiral galaxies, elliptical galaxies. We have distorted irregular galaxies. They're dwarf galaxies. They have all different shapes and sizes and they are different colors depending on what stage of evolution their stars are in. And so here you have this zoo of galaxies in an area on the sky no bigger than a grain of sand held at arm's length. So you ask yourself, how much of the sky does a grain of sand cover at arm's length? Take a picture of that, this is what you get. This is our universe in all its majesty. Brought to you by the James Webb Space Telescope. Oh yes, and so now, yeah, this is, I'm yeah. loving this one. So again, this is the iconic photo. Uh, yes, this one, people love in this one. So the James Webb Space Telescope is specially tuned to observe the universe using infrared light because the most distant galaxies, by the time their light reaches us, it's in the infrared part of the spectrum. So the telescope was conceived and designed to do that. But wait, infrared light also penetrates nearby gas clouds. And so this is the Carina Nebula. And you're seeing into a nebula that you would not otherwise have access to. If we looked at this with visible light, it would just be this big cloud and there'd be nothing there. And now you can look in and see stars. And there are places where stars are being born. This is a stellar nursery. Stars are made of gas. These are, where does that gas come from? It comes from gas clouds. And so, curiously, the James Webb Space Telescope has data from the beginning of the universe and from nearby places that are the beginning of stars themselves. And these stars will not only make star clusters, but also planets, and possibly even people. Probably not, other life forms. <laughs> we only have people on Earth, we're pretty sure. But again, you see the spiky other stars. These are nearby objects that are giving us those spikes. But this, is, this, this whole image is nearby. This is a relatively nearby region of the formation of stars within our galaxy. And so what has this all told us about the universe that we didn't already know? The good thing about the James Webb Space Telescope is that it's, it's opening a window to the universe that we didn't previously, previously have access to. So in the early universe, no telescope had ever seen there before. Deep in these gas clouds, no telescope had ever seen that before. And so you can make the list of what you expect to find, of course. We, based on any prior knowledge, but anytime you open a window, you've got to be ready to discover things that nobody ordered. 
that nobody asked for, that nobody even thought to wonder was there. So for me, the future of the, the James Webb Space Telescope is not what questions it can answer that we've already posed. It's what questions it will answer that we don't yet know to ask. Yeah, I mean, this is this I think has really captured people's imagination and has been been awesome. All right, so what are we looking at here? Okay, so now there are galaxies in the universe that are nearby other galaxies. They feel each other's gravity and they and they fall towards one another and interact. And that's the polite way to say it. What they're really doing is colliding. This is called Stefan's Quintet. There are five galaxies here. One of them is not really had not joined the party. The one in the bottom. The other four are actively colliding with each other. And when you collide, gas clouds smash into each other and they form stars when that happens. It sends shock waves through what we call the interstellar medium. And it, so curiously, the collision of galaxies is also the birth of stars. And you see these regions, these, these, these spots, the, the, all the, 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 the red regions where you have active star formation going on. It's called Stefan's Quintet. And when I saw this back when I was in graduate school many moons ago, it's just five, five smudges on the sky. You can't get inside and see what's going on with this resolution. So the telescope is bringing things that were previously hidden in plain sight to the front and enables, enables us to ask new questions, um, understand in great detail what goes on when, when galaxies collide. By the way, our own Milky Way is on a collision course with the Andromeda galaxy, two million light years away, and will collide in about six or seven billion years. I have it on my calendar, so <laughs> I'm gonna watch for that. Um, but it's a train wreck when it happens. These are still recognizable as discrete objects. Give this a few more years, a few more millions of years, as they start moving through each other and greatly disrupting their structure, and you're gonna end up with uh, what is basically a train wreck, and, but a new kind of galaxy, the sum of all of these galaxies. And, and as far as we know, every major galaxy has a black hole in its center. And so you can ask, when galaxies collide, what happens to their, to their black holes? All right? We, based on uh, uh, computer simulations, we know the black holes find each other and collide. And you know how we know they collide? because we see them with a whole other telescope, the, the Laser Interferometry Gravitational Wave Observatory, and that's LIGO, and we saw data from that. So all of the telescopes that we have on Earth and in the heavens come together to give us a coherent picture of our place in the universe. This is pretty wild. It's totally, and again, once again, we see the spiky stars that are just uh, sitting in front of us. Now, okay, where do I begin? All right, so every red-blooded star is going to die like this, okay? The sun, when it dies, it's going to look something like this. So now we're on a much, it's a bigger image, but it's a smaller scale. This is the gas sloughed off in the dying stages of a star. And the, the, the bit of light you see in the middle is the sort of leftover star once it's given up its outer layers. And this is called the Southern Ring Nebula. There's a ring nebula in the north, which is called the Ring Nebula, um, without modification. But in this image, you're seeing different layers of the sun that it got so big in its later stages, they become red giant stars. It becomes so big that gases just keep floating into space. And they get charged, they get, they get illuminated by the very hot center that's still there in the middle of the star. So to bask in the majesty of this object in the universe, not just looking at it on a small post-it stamp on a, or even on a computer screen. I mean, I'm in this. It's like I'm in a space station parked outside of this celestial object. So it feels very, very real. That's what you're after here. And I happen to know that the energy being emitted by that star in the middle is actually quite hostile to human physiology. It's very high in ultraviolet light which would be bad for you. So you would need filters and things, and, and uh, if, you're gonna, if, if you wanna be a tourist of the universe, have like different levels of sunscreen available <laughs> to you in the cabinet <laughs> so that you can get close to stuff that might otherwise fry your DNA. The SPF so, 2000? Yeah, or more okay, or I've, higher. I've got that. I've you got, got that, that. you got from, that. I wear it from time to time. Yeah, yeah. 
We're we're in space. This is this is a spacewalk, and I I do before we just jump into talking about what's going on here. I just want to give um, one quick plug that we're going to be working with NASA to live stream um, in VR the launch of of the uh, of the new Artemis. So can you explain like what what are, what are we looking at? All right, so we're floating here. So we're doing our own spacewalking. Okay. <laughs> what I love here is can you see these long uh, gold uh, strips? These are yeah, unfurled. These, <laughs> these are solar panels, and they're unfurled. All right, because again, you have to launch them somehow. There's, there's not a rocket that size, so you curl them up, and then they get unfurled back when they come back into space. And we see some of our fellow astronauts there, all right, and they they look like they're doing something busy when we're just sort of observing them. <laughs> and of course, when you are weightless, there is no up or down. So you can say, well, isn't Earth down? Not when you're weightless. We are weightless right now. And most people think just the act of being in space makes you weightless. That is false. That is just completely false. What's going on is this entire structure, everything, and the astronauts, everything is falling towards the Earth. You say, Kalham is not going to hit the Earth. Because it's all, say, we wave to the astronauts. Uh, we go, <laughs> we go, we're also moving sideways at five miles per second. You ever see the rocket launch? It goes up, but then wait, it goes down, down, you know, it goes downstream. All, so much of the energy is just to give it the speed. Why? Because it goes so far down range at the speed of five miles per second that for every foot it falls, the curvature of the Earth curves a foot away from it. So the point is, we are falling towards the Earth at the same rate that Earth's curved surface is curving away from us. And so everybody's in free fall, everything, at all times. Well, now we get to look towards Earth. This, the, yeah, this, these one, are the great this one really feels like we're falling. You know what's good about these images, if you do it late in the day for Earth, then you get shadows cast by uneven textures on the cloud tops. And so they become much more real when that happens. You see how long the shadows are on those clouds that are up there. Yeah. And you get to see storm systems brewing very uh, unstable air rising up, ready to make thunderstorms. And so right now we're transitioning out of daylight into Earth darkness. And at that speed of five miles per second, 18, 17, 18,000 miles an hour, at that speed, you orbit the Earth, you see 18 sunrises and sunsets a day. Huh. 18 a day. And I'm loving it. And there it is. All right. Well, that was pretty darkness. wild. Yeah. Should we head back go. to our space station? Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. All right. You know, what did you think of this whole experience? It's clearly ready for prime time. We have visual data on the universe and probably in other sciences, they have enough information about the structure of cells that any place you hadn't gone before because you, you couldn't or you just would read about it if you get to go inside. I, I don't see why that wouldn't be the next best thing. Uh, to do with your curiosity. So, yeah, I mean, I'm really interested in the kind of where this helps take education. I mean, we're already seeing, you know, doctors being trained for surgeries, doing it mm -hmm. more effectively when they can actually just see a big model of a knee that they're going to operate on, for example. And I just think that this is going to give people way more opportunities. Yeah, I think the, the applications are limitless, clearly. Awesome. All right, well, this has been super fun. Thank you for, for doing this. Okay, Mark, it's great great to meet you. And, and in fact, I, one day, maybe I'll get you on my podcast and we'll talk about yeah, I'd love to uh, do your, it. your love vision to do of the future because you're one of, the, one of the shakers and movers of where society is going to go in ways people well, have yet I, to dream. I would love to do that. I'm a huge fan of your work and, and everything you've done and how you inspire so many people about the wonder of the universe. So it's, it's awesome stuff and it's really awesome for, for me to get a chance to do this with you. So, you know, fist bump, yeah, fist bump, there you go. Good, you got All right. it. All right, dude. All right. See ya.